Ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, welcome to Shaky Airlines. Our pilot for today, Captain Frankensonnet, has turned on the fasten your seatbelt signs because it's going to be a bumpy flight. If you haven't yet stowed your emotional baggage, please do so now. In the event of an emergency, the exits are in the rear and to the side and in the front, but we all know you can never really go home, don't we? Now is the time to bring your attention spans up to their full and upright positions and to sit down and pay attention. Our cocktail cart will begin shortly, roaming through the aisles after the crew is sufficiently gassed up. Welcome to the flight to the land of misplaced signs. Well, we've settled back down, back in the sanitarium. This is the shaky sonnet show, and here we are at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have some lion couchants resting in the storage units. We're up to sonnets 37 and 38, and we have veered wildly off course. Uh, as I noted last time, once you hit the 30s, things start to go squanch-wise. And that has happened with us. In Sonnet 30, started us off with, with old woes, new whale, my dear time's waste. And oh goodness, it's, it's basically all death and destruction and misery from there. Sonnet 31 and 32 was more death and loss and a little bit of zombie kink thrown in. Sonnets 33 and 34, the clouds roll in, announcing trouble in zombie paradise. And 35 and 36, thunderclap. We too must be twain. It's over. And then, let me get my, let me get myself situated. I never did unpack. Pen. And we'll just set that right down there. Sonnets 37 and 38. We've been hijacked, is basically the story. These two little sonnets are caught in a Bermuda Triangle somewhere with no relation to any other of the sonnets in the 30s that I can tell, or even in the entire series. Now, some in the entire series, but they're completely out of place. If we're looking for a sustained narrative, which I am because they are in this order and I just have a hard time squeezing them into any understandable narrative. And maybe that's my deficit and not Shakespeare's. I doubt it, but <laughs> we'll see. So we're off course. We'll deal with 37 and 38 as the isolated, weird little abandoned islands that they are. And it's almost as if whoever organized this sequence says at 37 and 38, excuse me, we interrupt this increasingly dramatic sonnet sequence to bring you two boring sonnets. Boring, well, I guess not completely. They each have their moments, but they are, I feel, completely out of place in this sonnet sequence. So it's either that they are completely out of sequence or out of place in this sequence. That's the first possibility. The second possibility is that 37 and 38 are proof that these sonnets were never meant to be read as a sonnet sequence. Someone could argue that and I could see how that would fit in. Or the third choice is that there's simply minor interlude, interludes where Shakespeare thought, well, let's write a couple of sonnets and rework some old tropes like I'm nothing and you're my inspiration and if, any, if I ever write anything good it's all because of you because you're so fabulous. Which of course we've never heard before in this sonnet sequence. 
ho hum. Now, let's just let's just dive right in, take off as it will, get off the tarmac with 37 and 38, and let's start with 37. Coming out of nowhere after, let me confess that we too must be twain. 37. As a decrepit father takes delight to see his active child do deeds of youth, so I, made lame by fortune's dearest spite, take all my comfort of thy worth and truth. For whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, or any of these, all, or all, or more, entitled in thy parts do crowned sit, I make my love engrafted to this store. So then I am not lame, poor, nor despised, whilst that this shadow doth such substance give, that I in thy abundance am sufficed, and by a part of all thy glory live. Look what is best, that best I wish in thee, this wish I have, then ten times happy me. So, I don't know where this decrepit father thing comes in, and there are many commentators who believe that because of this sonnet that Shakespeare actually was lame in one leg, and they concocted all sorts of excuses, but sometimes a poet just uses devices, and I think that's what's going on here. I don't think it has anything to say. Everybody's so wild to, to map the sonnets onto some biographical uh, actuality or made-up actuality on Shakespeare, but I believe that he's just taking a lame person as a, some, a, an example. So he's saying in the first quatrain, as a decrepit father takes the light, you know, the father's dying, he sees a young child, so I made lame by fortune's dearest bite. Well, fortune's dearest bite is the passing of time. And hello, if you live to be as old as Shakespeare or as old as some drag queens, um, then things begin to sag. Things, you're not as spry as you once, once were. You can't dance all night at um, the clubs. But because of this, you look on the younger generation and you take, I take all my comfort... I take all my comfort of thy worth and truth. So here we are again, pity me a poor worthless lover. Any worth I have is because of my connection to you. Quatrain two, for whether, and this is actually, lines five and six are probably the two best lines in this poem. For whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, or any of these all, or all, or more, Entitled in thy parts do crowned sit, I make my love engrafted to this store. Again, I graft my, any good qualities that I have. I put myself onto the qualities that you have because you're superior and that makes me better. But the lines five and six, for whether, beauth, for whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, these um, nice little THs and the Bs and the Ts, which are sort of light percussives, in the sequence in which they occur, the W's also, whether beauty, birth, or wealth, or wit, they're just, they occur in quick succession and they glide right off the tongue. And it's followed by, or any of these all, which is a, a really rather nice statement. Whether all of these or any of these, either one of these, any of these all, or all, or more, all of those, those, T H's and T's and B's, those light percussives, followed by these long vowels, these open A's, these open O's. It's really quite a beautiful little sounding moment. And then, unfortunately, it's followed by line seven, entitled in thy parts do crowned sit, which is sort of a clunky follow-up. So if we just take lines five and six, this is a beautiful little sonnet, but we can't do that in a sonnet. The third quatrain brings home the argument and it expands it, the idea that, you know, you're so wonderful and anything that I am that's of any worth is because of you. It expands that metaphor by bringing out the sun so that the sun shines on the poet. It goes through the poet and it creates a shadow. And the only reason that the poet even knows he's alive is because of the 
glorious shining um, lover or the the brilliance of the lover's love shining upon him so that he can see a shadow and that he knows that he is alive simply because of his shadow. And then line 9 sort of echoes that list that we got in uh, 5 and 6 so that I am not lame, poor, nor despised. And line 9 and 9, line, excuse me, 11, despised and suffice, it's a very strange little rhyme. They don't quite rhyme, but you know, maybe it's the vowel shift happening again. Um, we get finally to the couplet, which is, Look what is best, that best, I wish in thee, this wish I have, then ten times happy me. Whatever your good qualities are, are I wish you even more of them, because the more of them you have, the happier I am, and the better that makes me. Ah, where's that drink cart? Here we go. Feel free to imbibe while we go through these. We go from 37, which seems to have nothing to do with we two must be twain. Um, unless, perhaps, it's a dramatic response to this very dramatic 35 and 36, where we get the poet and the lover maybe arguing with one another, or maybe trying to figure out, like, you did me wrong, I forgave you, we're no more, either way. And then maybe this is the poet coming back and saying some sort of dramatic response, a, a desperate plea saying, I'm not worthy of you, I'm not worthy of you, but I love you so much. It's just desperate and unattractive and in that sense perhaps not a bad thing for a dramatic moment. Because it's dramatic, it would be if it's a response, it would be dramatic delusional denial. And that's always sort of interesting to watch someone have a little mental breakdown. And that could be what's happening here. But I think that's a stretch. So then, what does Sonnet 38 give us? Nothing much that we haven't seen before. In fact, I think we've seen it much better in Sonnet 21, uh, which begins, So is it not with me as with that muse, stirred by a painted beauty to his verse? And that's a much better poem, but here we have 38 replaying the same old tune. And here we go again. It's a little bit of desperation, uh, self-abusing, pleading, I'm nothing without you. Comes off sort of pathetic if you ask me, but let's go through it. Again with the muse. 38. How can my muse want subject to invent while thou dost breathe that pourst into my verse thine own sweet argument, too excellent for every vulgar paper to rehearse. O oh, give thyself the thanks, if aught in me worthy perusal stand against thy sight. For who's so dumb that cannot write to thee, when thou thyself dost give invention light? Be thou the tenth muse, ten times more in worth than those old nine which rhymers invocate. And he that calls on thee, let him bring forth eternal numbers to outlive long date. If my slight muse do please these curious days, the pain be mine, but thine shall be the praise. So, the first quatrain. How can my muse want subjects to invent while thou dost breathe? How, how could anybody have any problem writing a poem about you. And here we are back again. Forget about whatever troubles they've been going through. He's trying to remind someone that he's a writer and whoop de doo for that. How can anyone have trouble writing a sonnet about glorious you who pours into my verse thine own sweet argument? Meaning uh, a very attractive literary theme. An argument would be a literary theme. Um, which is too excellent for el every vulgar paper to rehearse. Paper meaning the paper on which a poem is written, and by extension, um, a poem. So every vulgar, you know, anybody could write a poem, but once they write a poem about you, it shines because you're the object. Give thyself the thanks, Quatrain 2 begins. If aught in me 
here we are. This is the poet again saying, well, I, I, I'm just a poet. I don't know if I can do you justice. If aught in me worthy perusal stand against thy sight, if I create anything that's worth looking at, for who's so dumb that cannot write to thee when thou thyself dost, dost give invention light? Who's so dumb, meaning without speech? Who, who cannot summon the words to praise you when they see the glory that is you? Third quatrain, be thou the tenth muse, because all the other nine muses that are known in mythology, none of them are sufficient. You be the tenth muse and as such ten times more in worth than those old nine which rhymers invocate. And he that calls on thee, let him bring forth eternal numbers to outlive long date. Eternal numbers, numbers being metrical verse or, or a poem to outlive long date. So here we are back basically to the beginning of the series, uh, first poem through the 17th, where I'm a poet and I can do you justice. I'll make you live forever and you're so wonderful that you do all the work for me. If my slight muse, because you know I'm just a poet and really I'm not that good, but really I am pretty good because I'm Shakespeare. If my slight muse do please these curious days, the pain be mine, but thine shall be the praise. And the pain here is simply the work that one must put into writing a poem. If I write anything, and someone likes it, I've done all the work, but all the praise belongs to you because you're you and I wouldn't have written it without this. So, uh, I think I need another drink after that. Now, as I said before, we could look at 37 and 38 as if it's a pair of sonnets addressing 35 and 36 where it's a demonstration of the crushed human spirit. And that's always interesting. Everyone likes a good meltdown every once in a while, but I don't buy it. They just seem out of place. Now, as to whether a male or a female is spoken about, is either speaking or is spoken about, Again, as in 35, where all men make faults, could mean simply mankind, because that's the general term. It does suggest that there is a man. And here, father, the same thing. Um, the comparison with a father to the poet seems implicit, because otherwise, why wouldn't he have chosen mother? So we'll give him a, we'll give him a penis for the moment. And possibly the lover is, the person to whom this poem is addressed, is also a male, but it's not necessary. In 38, the narrator, there's that, and he that calls on thee, meaning the, the muse, not necessarily the lover, but it seems to suggest that the poet is also a male. So the same situation could be a male speaking to a female, could be a male speaking to a male. It could come off either way. Dramatically, it could work one way or another. And if we take the conventions of the time to be men as the possible archetypes, then perhaps it could be a woman speaking to a man and just using that metaphor. So. 37 and 38, we've taken a long, long detour, veered way off course, dipped into the land of lost sonnets where we have self-pity, ugly desperation, old worn out tropes, where all of these rule the land. And that's 37 and 38. We'll get back on course when next we meet with sonnet 39. We'll tip our wings. There will be some more turbulence coming up in 39 and 40, but at least we'll know where we're going from there. It will seem, it will fit into my idea of a dramatic progression or a, a narrative progression, and I think that makes it a bit more interesting as we go along. So what say you? Do you think I'm completely off my rocker? Do you think I'm, I'm, I'm 
you know, my oxygen level is too low and I can't think clearly and I don't see what everybody else should see about 37 and 38 that it fits right in? If so, let me know in the comments or let me know what you think in general about these poems. Until we meet again, get your head out of the clouds, look around, see the wonders that are in the world, and pay attention. Until we meet again, I am Too Tight Let Trek, and this has been The Shaky Sonnet Show. Oh.